So we used to have this, uh, wow, we used to have this um, competition as missionaries. It was, nobody explained it, the rules or anything. But we all knew. We all knew the game. And the game was, the more you suffered, the better missionary you were. And we won most of the time. We won the game. Um, if you were poor, you were really, 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 really anointed. And then if you were poorer than the other one who was poor, you were super anointed. And the more misery you could record in your newsletter of how hard it was being a missionary, the more you felt like a missionary. And the more you stayed in that place, the more people thought you were a real missionary. Not that they wanted to join you. <laughs> and we lived that way for a long, long time. In fact, sweet Jesus, my husband lived that way for four generations. Now, it was a wonderful thing in many ways. Really. But it was also very sad in many ways because we didn't understand some things that we understand now. Holy. There's a new breed of missionary. They're not afraid to die. They're not afraid to suffer. They're not afraid to lay down. They're not afraid to shine. They're not afraid. That's it, period. They're not afraid. And they don't compete. No more competition. They actually cooperate with all the other radical lovers of Jesus, nationals and internationals. I kept seeing a picture this weekend. It's not a table with an edge, it's a round table. And all of us are sitting together, it's a round table. And we all have a voice. <sighs> Rollin and I, we, we, we really, wow, we really, 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 really tried hard. We won most of those competitions. <laughs> we lived in the worst slum we could find. We didn't need any cheese. No hot water in the winter. No, that was for wimpy people who weren't dedicated to Jesus. People who ate cheese. <laughs> Those people would never understand what it was to really be a missionary. Those people that wasted money on hot water. How could anyone think they could do such a thing? <laughs> the poor don't have any hot water. The poor don't have cheese. <laughs> we felt very pitifully amazing. I had a pair of shoes back then. 
By the way, I'm not that old. I started preaching when I was 16. Some of you are all calling me granny and you're 55. Don't do that. It's annoying. I had a pair of shoes. And they, back then, you had to wear these little, little heels. I look at your shoes, you took them off. Thank you, Jesus. I'm like, how does she do that? It's amazing, she's in her anointing. She has a shoe anointing. If I tried to walk in her shoes, I would literally fall over and die. It's amazing. I, I've looked at him two, two days now in awe. I'm sitting next to you. They're going, wow, how did she do it? It's extraordinary. The Lord wants you to walk in your anointing. Seriously, don't try to walk in someone else's. You're going to walk in your anointing. Your anointing. Come on, your anointing. So I had these little shoes. They had heels about that big. That was my high ones. Those were the high ones. About that big, but I worn them so long, the heel wore down. They were about down to here. And I was just walking, and I felt really anointed about the fact that I only had this one pair of shoes. And I was really happy about it because that's how any good missionary would live. You know, two pairs, just excessive. <laughs> Unless you're some people who really like shoes. And I thought like that. And I had these shoes, and, and I'm, I'm, my feet hurt. They actually hurt a lot. And, um, and this lady, this little Pentecostal fireball, she's about, f she's one of the only people who's not as tall as I am. <laughs> she's about here. I felt tall around her, Marta. Every time I looked, I felt tall. I said, yes. That's a very rare thing, unless it's a child. <laughs> but there she was, and, and we're walking down the streets of Hong Kong, and she said, switch your shoes. She was a southern, southern woman. Switch your shoes, honey. And I'm being a good missionary. What's a good missionary do? Zip in a boca. You never tell anyone your need. Don't do it. We had a rule, don't ever do it. If they drag it out of you and strangle you, you might say something, but don't do it. You don't mention a thing, we're good, we're good, we're all good, we're all good. Are you, have, do you have food today? We're good. <laughs> you want cheese? <laughs> we're good missionaries. And I had these little pair of shoes, and my feet hurt, and that little fireball woman, she was kind of like you. She had a whole closet full of shoes. I found out later, a whole, and she was so short, you know. You're not even short. Not, anyway, you're tall, and then you're, anyway, she was like you, sweetie. She had these tall shoes like yours, all, all like, she had like, I don't know, she had 170 pairs or something. I don't know. She had so many shoes. I'm not saying you do, honey. I'm telling you my spiritual mother who taught me this story. She didn't have anything else. <laughs> she, wait, she had anointing. But that's all she owned were the shoes. So she said, she, I'm not kidding you, she really didn't have, she didn't own a home, she, <laughs> but she had shoes. Anyway, so she's walking down there in Hong Kong with me and she said, switch your shoes. And I'm a good missionary, I'm walking. Switch your shoes. Switch your shoes. I'm, like, I'm getting upset now. 
I'm getting upset. I'm feeling upset with this woman. I do not want her, even though I honor her and love her, to talk to me anymore about shoes. I want to just say, stop it. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. Being the good missionary I was, being one who won the prize for misery and suffering, I was not about to tell her that's my only pair of shoes because then I'd lose brownie points as a missionary. I'd actually say my needs. So I'm like, finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. And I said, I only have this one pair. She fell to her knees in the streets of Hong Kong fell to her knees. She grabbed my feet and she grabbed them and she said, blessed are the feet of those who carry the gospel. Blessed are the feet of those. You have, you have a shoe anointing. You have a shoe anointing from now on forevermore. Yes, you do. And she's like praying in the tongues in the middle of Hong Kong. I'm thinking, wow, she is not sensitive about who's around, but they didn't understand her anyway. It was could have been another dialect. She was like, shakarabahadarabah, shande, shoes, 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 shoes. And I'm thinking, wow, she's really excited about these shoes. (laughs) And then she says, you're coming with me, honey. She says, you're coming with me right now. I'm thinking, where are we going? And she takes me right into a shoe store. She takes me right into this shoe store. Hong Kong's full of shoe stores. You should be praying for Hong Kong right now. (laughs) Not about the shoes. Other things. Pray. So she takes me in there and she says, all right, we're getting shoes. Now, she liked shoes like you, those high ones. But they didn't, you know, they didn't really suit me, but she liked them, so she said I should get a pair. Spike red heels. I'm like. But she was excited. She bought me three pair of shoes. And I wore them, and I wore them, and I wore them. And I learned about the shoe anointing from her, and then I forgot. I totally forgot. I completely forgot about it. We were then, years later, we got wrecked by Holy Spirit. We got filled with the Lord. We got in just undone by the goodness of God. And we were now in Mozambique and serving the poorest people on the planet. And my favorite place on earth, and Steve knows that my favorite place on the planet for years was the garbage dump. You knew it. Everybody knew it. That's where I like to be. It made me happy. It wasn't miserable. I didn't smell the smoke. I liked it. I just enjoyed it. And every time someone would ask me for my shoes, which was every time I went there, I I only had um, flip-flops, but every time they asked me, I'd take them off. And I'd give them to them. And everybody knew it. And I walked to the garbage dump barefoot. This is after I'd been wrecked in Toronto, after I understood the love of the Father, after I had already started thinking that we no longer had a missionary competition, after all of it, I would take my shoes and I would give them to whoever asked for them first. They would have a little thing themselves. They would know, Mama Ida's going to give her shoes away, so whoever asks first is going to get those flip-flops. And I would walk on the garbage dump barefoot, thinking that was holy. And one day, I ended up in the hospital. We were already in northern Mozambique. I ended up in the hospital for 33 days, dying of MRSA. I didn't understand the shoe anointing. I didn't understand what God was asking. I didn't understand who he is and what he does. I didn't understand how God himself can multiply us if we lay our lives down. I didn't understand. One day in the dump, the Lord actually asked me, he said, did I ask you to give away those shoes? Did I ask you to give away those shoes? And I thought it was the enemy. Like, 
I felt like rebuking that voice. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. What kind of a selfish person wouldn't give their flip-flops to poor people in a garbage dump who walk around in glass? I didn't understand that God, if I really knew him, if I really knew him in a way he, he wants me to know him, that I would believe him to go ahead and multiply all of you. <laughs> and there would be shoes, enough for everyone. Now, a few people taught me you can tell one story more than once. So I'm gonna ask for the tallest guy in the room, please. Big, tall guy, oh, I know, Joel. <laughs> Come here, Joel. Thank you, sweetie, you'll help me. This is Joel. <laughs> Amazing, Miss Sherry Nepal. <laughs> Yay. Okay, Joel, we're gonna switch shoes. All right. I'm giving Joel my shoes. Cause he, he's a missionary. He needs anointing, I've got it. I do, that's no joke. I've got anointing, whoa! I've been a missionary now f going on 40 years. That's a lot. I've seen well over a million souls come to Jesus. I've got anointing and I've got shoes here. And I could give these to you. Some people, you know, they just take my shoes. They say, oh, I get the shoes, I get the anointing. Happens in Brazil, happens in other countries, Korea. There's my shoes, Joel. I just need yours. Thank you, sweetie. Can you just put those on, please? And walk now in the anointing, because I'm in missions, sweetie. Come on, come on, what's your problem? Get them, come on, Joel. Come on, sweetheart. There you, no, yeah. Those are anointed shoes. I've been a missionary for 40 years now. Come on, sweetie, there you go. All right, let's walk. Ready to walk, let's preach the gospel. Come on. You see, how's this working for you? Not so good? You lost one of my shoes. What'd you do, ditch the anointing? What's going on with you? Don't you want a double anointing? I mean, come on, Joel. I got the double anointing. He's got one shoe. Do you understand? If we walk around trying to wear somebody else's shoes, trying to do missions, somebody else's anointing, people are going to think we're, we're just a little strange. They're going to be, we're going to be preaching, preaching the gospel. And people aren't even going to hear what we're saying because they're going to be looking at our feet. And we're going to be preaching away. And we're going to be saying how, how much we've learned from all the other missionaries and all the other movements. How we're going to be preaching about how powerful it is to walk in the anointing of those who went before. And there we are, preaching away, and nobody can hear us. Because they're all looking at our shoes. And they're wondering what we're thinking. It's like missionaries trying to copy another missionary, trying to be a spectacular follower of someone else. When Jesus knows all cultures and all shoe sizes and all anointings, 
that he wants to give. Hallelujah. So the Lord says to you, wear your own shoes. Walk in your own anointing. Shaka Baba. Walk in your own anointing. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to walk in your own anointing? You're still watching. Because you see, I'm still walking in Joel's shoes. Now they're quite comfortable, unlike Robin's, I think. These I can walk in. But still, you're having trouble concentrating on anything else I'm saying because you're obsessed with the fact that these shoes don't fit me. Why is it that we keep trying to walk in someone else's anointing? Walk in the anointing God has given you to walk in as a scientist, as a professor, as a doctor, as a lawyer, as a king, uh, holy, holy laid down. I mean a king of a tribe. There are kings of tribes. I talk to them all the time. Some of you are like, there's only one king, Jesus. I know he's the king of kings. I'm talking about the other guys. Walk in your anointing. And when you walk in your anointing, God can take your little life. And he can anoint your little life. And he can do whatever he wants to do with your little life. And you can walk alongside another who may look like your brother or may look like they come from another family. <laughs> but we're still one family. Right, Joel? Holly is the lamb. I'm giving you back your shoes. Thank you, sweetheart. really does have big feet. <laughs> Woo. I'm not sure I want to put them on. Sometimes you got to walk barefoot. Wow. Scripture, did you want a scripture? I'm in the word all the time. So like, I'm in the word all the time. I love the word of God. I love the word of God. <laughs> love it. My phone, I've got like 20 translations of the Bible in different languages. I just love it. Roland was looking at me the other day. I had Makua solar Bible just playing in the house. He's like, oh, what are we doing? I said, it's Makua. It's the word of God going forth. He's like, okay. <laughs> just love the word of God. I'm going to read just a little bit about multiplication. It's only 816. We started early. I'm almost done. Don't worry. If you're freaked out, don't worry. It's not going to be that long. Yes, it is. It's just, the Lord so, he taps me. He's like, it's, it is long. It's their whole life. It's long. It's your whole life. And you're called to live a long life carrying the gospel, carrying the glory of God. It is long. It's your whole life. Give it for Jesus. Walking in the anointing. God gave you. All of you missionaries. All of you Holy Ghost filled missionaries. Carrying the love of Jesus to the broken, the sick, the dying, the poor, the leper, and the dead. Hey, Shakaraba, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Preach good news to the poor. Raise the dead. Any 
anyone who doesn't know Jesus as Savior and Lord is dead. Won't you love them? Won't you see them? Won't you carry this glorious gospel as a professor, as a mom, as a sound engineer, as a driver, as a football player, as an artist, as an IT expert, as a cheese banker. <laughs> That's an anointing right there. That's an anointing. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to read the scripture. I'm putting on, I got, by the way, these are comfortable. I've got more than one pair. <clears throat> Macy's. It's a store in America, $36. They're fantastic. I love, thank Jesus for comfortable shoes. Okay. Scripture. Here they are, John 6. Jesus crossed to the fort. Oh, shaka baba. I'm super wrecked, but I can still read. <sighs> oh, I gave my testimony today on podcast. I couldn't read till I was 16, but that's another point for another time. I can read now. That's a good point. Shaka baba. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far, 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 far shore of the Sea of Galilee. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up to the mountainside, sat down with the disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. Jesus went up, sat down with his disciples. Did you get that? Where was he? Galilee. Don't forget Israel. Galilee. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Will talked about this a bit this morning. He already knew what he was going to do. Do you guys know that God already knows what he's going to do in your nations? He already has it. Like, was, do you think God of the universe was super surprised when two cyclones hit Mozambique in six weeks? Was he just going, oh, 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 no, oh, no. He knew. Some of you all don't like that. You don't like a God who knows things. God knew about it. He knew exactly what was going to happen. You're saying, why didn't he stop it? I don't know. I'm not God. <laughs> All I know is when it happened, he said, go. Feed the poor. Go love the broken. Go carry the gospel. Jesus saw the multitude. Do you understand? Saw them. Do you see them? Do you see the multitude? Not a rhetorical question. Answer. You can answer even though you're Australian. <laughs> you can speak out. He saw the multitude. Do you see? Yes. yes. If you see, then things change. I want to talk to you for a moment about someone who didn't see. I want to talk to you a moment about someone who didn't see. It's, it's a powerful story that taught me so much about the gospel. I was busy as we are. Is anyone ever busy? Not you, Steve. Oh. No, I mean busy. He's got hundreds of kids they're looking after. Hundreds. They used to have more. Now they're looking after more families. Yay! 
That's just very cool. Anyway, busy. Anybody ever get busy on the field? Anybody? Or just me? Anybody, you just get busy. You're like doing this stuff. There's meetings and there's more meetings. And then there's more meetings after those meetings. And, but you have a lot of prayer meetings, so somehow you survive. Busy. We can all get busy, even though we understand Holy Spirit. We love Holy Spirit. You can see our tribe. We're like, ah. we just love Holy Spirit. We love God. We love to be with the Lord. Oh, we love to be with him. We love his presence more than life. That's why we go. We don't go because we think we're, you know, spiritual orphans and we're going to earn God's favor. No, 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 no. We go because we know that he's a good father. We know Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We go because we're in love. We go because we're in love. So Jesus saw one day I was busy, busy, busy. I was doing good things. I felt happy about it. I f the, this mama friend of mine that some of you know, I think Pamela knows her. Her name's Tina. She's just a sweet, sweet mama. She's really, really, really old. I'm not old. She's old. She's really old. And she's really sweet. And she's, she's a little bit, you know, kind of like, like this, cute little cute granny. I led her to Jesus. She's cute. She just rattles off. She speaks Makua and Makandi and something that's not Portuguese, but she thinks it is. <laughs> and she's really cute. And so I went there to go um, dedicate a house. She was living under, under a tree. And I uh, felt led to you know, build her a house. It was a modest house, because if you build people a nice house, other people will steal it. So it was a really modest house. It was made out of local material, rocks and, and bamboo and, and some mud and some cement on there, because we kind of snuck it in. And, and it had a tin roof, which was a big deal. And I went there, and, and I, I, I was super excited about this. So my busyness was joyful business. And I was with my friend, and I was picking up trash. Some of y'all don't understand our life because you only see us when we're out somewhere, somewhere, other than where we usually are. My normal life, just in the village, picking up trash, hanging out with my friend, and um, just excited about being alive, but a bit busy because there was a lot of trash picking it up, started seeing people come around. They were wondering what I was doing. Why was this little mama out there with this other very much older mama? What was I doing with her? And so I sat down next to the latrine and I started to talk to them. I just, I said, you can ask me anything you like. And we started to have a conversation. We started to have a conversation about life about why I was there. Tina and I had a really beautiful moment where we're just holding each other, sobbing together. She said, I never dreamed I would live in such a palace. It wrecked me. I was, t I was undone by it. It's all a matter of perspective. She saw her house as a palace. She'd been living under a tree. To her, that was the most beautiful home she could have ever imagined. Sitting next to the latrine, and uh, these people gathered around, about 16 of them. And because I love sharing the gospel, and I'm not, I'm not like pushed to do it. Nobody's clocking me to see if I'm, how many people I'm leading to Jesus every day. I love to lead people to Jesus. I enjoy it. So I'm sitting there and I'm talking to these people and, and for some reason I, I started to think, well, there's a little crowd gathering around. I don't know, 14, 16, I'm not a really a counter. And they were sitting down next to me and, and I just told them the story of Jesus, very just beautiful story of Jesus, what he'd done and why Tina and I were friends. Because we wouldn't be friends normally, but we were friends. And why did I leave where I was from to come 
where I needed more melanin. <laughs> but uh, there I was. And we had this great time, and then all of them said, yes, of course, they would like to meet Jesus. And we prayed, and they all met Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And it was so easy. It was so beautiful. It was so wonderful. And then I said, would you like to help me? See, I mean, remember Will's story today, that demonized guy that got set free by Jesus became a preacher that day. So I figured these people that just met Jesus could help me doing what I was doing, which was picking out trash. And they did. They said, sure, we'll help you. They said, of course, we'll help you. And we started picking up trash and burning up trash because Tina had a new house, and I wanted it to look pretty around there. In fact, I wanted to plant some plants. You could say, why would you bother with that? Because God likes beauty, and it matters. And it matters that we could have a beautiful spot there. It might not look beautiful to you, but to Tina and to me, it was one of the most beautiful places on the planet. So finally, I realized I had to go back to my discipleship meeting, which is really important because we have a lot of disciples. And I know discipleship's important. If you think I don't know that, I do. Just saying. Even in my shoes, I know that. So I'm going back to do discipleship. And I'm climbing down the hill, and I see a woman that upsets me. My eyes are open, and I see a woman that disturbed me. Have you ever been disturbed by someone? I was disturbed by this woman. Everything within me understood that this woman was in the wrong place that she should not have been where she was. And she disturbed me by being her. And I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart, stop for her. And I did a very sad thing. What did I do? I looked at my watch. I heard the Lord say, stop, and I looked at my watch. That's an embarrassing thing to tell you. That's a sad thing to tell you. But if I don't tell you my failure, I can't share with the victory of what God is doing through a little life, through a little movement, through all of us that just keep saying yes. Because we're all flawed little people. But God can do anything with anyone if we just say yes. And we're quick. We're quick to stop. When the Lord says stop and we're quick to say, so sorry, so sorry, Jesus, we cry out, change the way I think. And so I put my watch behind my back and I sat down next to this disturbing woman. And I looked at her. In fact, I took a hold of her hand And I took a hold of this woman's hand and I said, What's your name? Celia, I'm so glad you have a name. And your mama loves you and papa loves you and daddy God loves you. Oh, I'm so glad she has a name. And she answered me. This mama, as I held her hand and I looked her in the eyes, she couldn't look me back in the eyes. Why could she not look me back in the eyes? Because she had no pupils. She was a woman alone in the sun, sitting in the sun in Mozambique, which is only something a very strange person would do. She's sitting in the sun in Mozambique with no pupils, and as I take her hand and ask her her name, she says, I have no name. That disturbed me too. And I didn't feel to say, well, let me tell you about the one 
who can give you new eyes. I didn't feel to say, let me tell you about your father in heaven who adores you. I just felt to give her a name because God cares about us. He sees. You see, when Jesus saw the multitude, he asked the disciples, what are we going to do? Knowing very well what he was going to do. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He was going to use a little kid with a lunch, a child, not a goat, a child. And so I looked at her, and she looked with no pupils. She squeezed my hand, and I said, I'm going to give you a name. And those of you who know the story, it's a powerful story. I gave her a name. It's called, her name is Utelia. You exist with joy. Utelia. Utelia, you exist with joy. And I held her in my arms, and we rejoiced together. And I'm rocking her in my arms in the dirt, in the sun. This little woman who had no name. And the Lord who is Lord, who is King, who is Jesus, who saw Utelia, turned her eyes brown. He turned her eyes brown. Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, turned Utelia's eyes brown. Holy is the Lamb. It undid me. You see, life, if we are in a hurry trying to do missions, trying to get to our disciples, trying to do something, maybe trying to take an offering. <laughs> we can miss what God actually wants us to do. We can miss it like the blind side of a bar. Jesus called us to stop and to see and to be the hands and the feet. I didn't have to go into some long argument with this precious Utelia. She started laughing with the joy of the Lord. You wonder if God will make you laugh. That lady, she had like three teeth. I want to pull them out because they were dangling there. <laughs> like a six-year-old. Just tug it, you know. She's like, oh, her teeth are falling out. She was so happy. She was so full of joy. She was so full of Jesus, joy. And I said, you know, the one who gave you these eyes, the one who told me to give you a name because he sees you and he knows you. That one, Jesus, oh, he's so beautiful. He left the streets of gold. He left everything and he came down here and he became a, a person on the planet fully. And I was just telling her this story in a simple way. And I said, do you want to follow this one, Jesus? She said, oh, yes. Yes. There was no hesitation in her. <laughs> she met Jesus. And then I hopped into my truck. I got to the discipleship meeting. Some of those guys led 2,000 congregations. That was kind of an important meeting, don't you think? I'd been discipling them already for 12 years. They barely noticed when I walked in. Except they could see I was happy. They were just doing really well discipling themselves. I walked in and I said, what have you been learning? And they started sharing. They'd been learning. They'd been discussing. They'd been at a round table, you see. All nationals. I told them about Utelia, and we all rejoiced together. Hallelujah. Holy is a lamb. Thank you, Jesus. Here it is. Two more points. 7C. I'm on 7C. Holy. 
7B. I'm a systematic theologian. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> I don't have a beard, though. <laughs> ah. Here we go. It's 8.38. We're good. We're winding up to go out. We're winding up to go out. We're winding up to go out. We're winding up to go out to carry this glorious gospel out there. Shakaraba, we just don't end it and fizzle out like a big old balloon. Pop, fizzle. That's how some meetings are. Wind it up. <laughs> wow! <laughs> I don't want that kind of a meeting. I want something where the wind of the spirit literally lifts us up. It just doesn't blow up a balloon, but it lifts us up into the presence of God and we become the people that go with joy in our hearts like radical laid down lovers who wear their own shoes and aren't afraid to do whatever God gives them to do. Whatever it is, hiking boots, spike heels, it's all beautiful when it's, when it's anointed in him. When he gives you the anointing to walk in your shoes, it's the most beautiful thing you could ever do. Never switch them <laughs> for somebody else's. It's amazing what God wants to do through your life. As soon as I understood that, instead of taking off my shoes, in the garbage dump and taking off my shoes. They weren't shoes, they weren't proper shoes. I get in trouble for wearing flip-flops to the government. I actually have a pair of these in, in, in my car under the seat in case I have to do a government office. Pull out the Macy's fancy ones. I do. Ask anybody. They even got a pair in our bush plane. Someone said, well, there's someone left their shoes. I said, no, no. I got a government meeting. I'm sure of it. And they're going to be ticked off if I got on flip-flops. Sometimes you have to switch your shoes for different occasions. But they still have to fit you. Hey, like clothes. I wear a couple on a lot. But you know what? When I'm in your country, I'm not wearing a couple on them. Did you notice? I'm not wearing a couple on it because if I wore a couple on it, you'd think I was just a strange little odd little missionary and you'd say, oh, that looks so ridiculous. Does she think she's black? <laughs> but in my country, the clothes I wear, they fit in. Even though I can't change my uh, fact that I need skin cream. It's okay, God made me this way. I held my hair. I was born with this color, but now I help it. <laughs> That's okay too. Just saying, there's honesty. Once I believed in the shoe anointing, God started bringing us shoes. Anyone who works with us, especially the old timers, <laughs> would watch containers of shoes show up. 40 foot container full of shoes. Shoes, shoes, shoes. We have more shoes coming through. Shoes and shoes. Container after container of shoes. They just keep coming. One group in Florida just felt led to give us shoes. They sent us an entire container full of shoes. Another good Samaritans who are wonderful Christians. Ha <laughs> ha! Shaka Baba, just saying. They sent us another 40-foot container of shoes. 
by after the fact that I learned about that shoe anointing, we've been given over 500,000 pairs of shoes. Somebody should rejoice. If you think you have shoes, honey, I got shoes. You got shoes. You're going to have more shoes. Whoa, that's awesome. I got shoes, shoes, shoes. One time I was in a store in South Africa. I, I wanted shoes. I, I got this shoe anointing. I told you when the Lord gave it to me, and my spiritual mom gave it to me, and I lost it. Then God gave it back. Thank you, Jesus. And I, I went to the store, and I saw an aisle of shoes, and I went like this. I had a cart, one cart here, and one cart back there. And I'm like pulling shoes and pulling a cart like this. And I'm throwing shoes in this cart. And the security guard came. The security guard came and said, what are you doing, woman? I said, I'm, I'm getting shoes. He said, why aren't you looking? You're not getting shoes. This is not allowed. I said, are you not selling shoes? I'm getting shoes. I see you're selling shoes. He said, but you didn't look at the price. And I knew I was in a cheap store, so I didn't need to look at the price. Some stores, you better look at the price. But anyway, I didn't look at the price. I was in a pep or something, and a pep, you just throw them in your cart, and um, they will be cheap. But I didn't look at the size. He said, why are you not looking at the size? Why are you not looking at the price? Didn't want to offend him and say, it's pep. I don't need to look at the price. <laughs> I just said, I need shoes. He said, why do you? You're just taking them all. You can't do that. We're calling more security. I said, well, excuse me, sir, but I have a lot of children. And they all like to wear shoes. They said, what are you talking about? I said, I have a lot of children. I think they all want to have shoes. He said, well, how many children? I said, <laughs> you don't want to know. I just said, do you have any more shoes, sir? He said, what are you saying? I said, I need a whole lot of shoes because we have a whole lot of kids and they all want shoes. And then I pulled out a few pictures. He started crying. He said, next time, call us ahead of time. <laughs> hey, when you see... When you can see, God will start to multiply. When you can see and your eyes are open like Utilia's eyes were open, God will start to multiply. When your eyes are blind and you don't see, then things will always be small and you'll just feed your little family of four. God wants to open your eyes and open your heart. And I want to ask you to stand, please, so that you're not worried. show. Listen, Jesus saw the crowd. He saw the crowd. And Philip was counting and more people were counting and they said eight months wages can't buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. It's true. Another brother spoke up. Here's a boy. Here's a child. Here's a little child with five small barley loaves, two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Here's some little kids of all ages and sizes. <laughs> all different backgrounds, all different gifts. So you look at them and you say, well, they're just extraordinary and I could never be like them. That's true. You couldn't be like them. In the sense that you'll never be able to wear the shoes that each one wears. You'll never be able to fit their shoes. You might squeeze into them, but you'll never be able to wear the shoes that Hank wears, or Wayne wears, or Angela wears, or Joel wears, or Tammy wears, or Pamela wears, or Sean wears. Any of them, they're all extraordinary. But the extraordinary thing about this group of people here 
is they brought their loaves and they brought their fish. The extraordinary thing is that each one of them said yes. They realized that in themselves, they look ridiculous. You look at Nepal, Philippines, you look at Korea, North Korea, you look at Mozambique, you look at Zambia, you look at California, you look, you look at Alice Springs, you look anywhere out there, you just look out there. You look at China, you look at Ethiopia, you look, you look, you look out there and you look at yourself, you look at these people and you think, what on earth are they thinking? Are they seriously just nuts? Do they not understand how many millions of people, billions of people there are on the planet? They don't even pronounce their dialects correctly. Many of them aren't even, <laughs> even qualified. Are they nuts? Think about that little boy in the book. He wasn't somebody just who was super extraordinary. Wowie, zowie, razzmatazz, go, wow, wow. Here's a kid, he's amazing. He's just gonna come to you, Jesus, and thousands and tens of thousands of people are gonna be fed, woo! He was just a little kid, they are just, Little people, some of them really little. <laughs> and some of them look not so little, but they still are little. We're all little, little people with little, little lunches. But if we give God all we have, he can multiply it. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> the thing that's extraordinary about this group of people is they just were... They were yielded enough. They were full of faith enough. I love that message Paul gave. They were full of faith enough. They got rid of the doubt enough that they just said, yes! And a lot of people said, you're nuts. You need to stop. What are you thinking? You're the wrong color, the wrong socioeconomic background, the wrong height. Everything, every excuse to keep them from laying it all down. But we learned something. God can use anyone. If he could use a donkey, he can use a daughter. Yeah. Hey. hey, I'm not offended by that statement. Because I know who my God is. And I know that he can use me. So I only have one response. Take it all. Here's my lunch. Here's my fish, here's my bread, here's my life, here it is, here it is, because I see, I see the lost, I see the broken, I see the hungry church, I see the dying, I see the poor, I see the children being sold for sex. I see, and once I see, there has to be a response inside of me. What is yours? What is yours? with no band, with no background, no 
winding up. Anyone? Is there anyone who will say, take me? Use me. Take me. Use me. Take me. Use me. Shoot. Come on. Take me. Use me. Take me. Use me. Shukarapa. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, right now. All over this room. Just lift your hand. Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us. As you lift your hands and yield your heart, focus your eyes right now on Jesus. And I want you to turn, if you are if you really mean what you just said, turn your hands upward. My son-in-law, Love, wrote a song with his band about climbing a mountain with hands wide open. Right now, some of you need to find a spot to kneel down in. Some of you need to find a spot to lay down in. Some of you need to keep standing. I don't know what your response is, but as you, as you just turn your hands upward, we are seriously saying the best thing you can ever do with your life, all your life, all your talents, all your gifts, even though they're small and insignificant in the face of a lost and dying world, if you would turn everything you are and all you have over to Jesus, he will multiply it. Is there anyone in this room including these missionaries that will just lay it all down. Just lay it all down. Just give it all. Give it all to Jesus. Give it all to Jesus. Give it all to Jesus. So many, give it all to Jesus. Give it all to Jesus. Close your eyes. Respond your own way. I can't tell you how to respond. I just know that the Holy Spirit is drawing people to a response. There's got to be a response inside of us that hands it over to Jesus, that gives it over to Jesus as a professor, as a pastor, as a aid worker, as a minister, as a governor, as a king. As a papa, as a mama, something inside of us, as a gifted person in some area, we turn over our gift, our, our gift, our life, our everything to Jesus right now. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to move all over, all over this room. Shake it up. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Sweet Holy Spirit, I'm asking you. I'm asking you, Lord, you see. When that offering, there was an offering taken and there were rich people, talented people, gifted people, rich, rich people that gave large sums. But Jesus only pointed out one. And maybe that's what's happening tonight. Jesus pointed out a little widow who put in a copper coin and tonight, as we're talking about lives, and we're not talking about finance right now, although finance has to do with your life, we're talking about lives. Maybe there's somebody here like that widow. Maybe you're the least qualified. Maybe you're the most broken one in the room. 
Maybe you're the least qualified. Maybe you're the smallest. Maybe you're the tallest. Maybe you're, maybe you absolutely don't see any gift inside yourself, but something inside of you says, if Jesus wants what I have, I'm going to run to the altar, lay down my life. I'm going to give it to him, even though it doesn't make sense in the face of a dying, broken world. I am going to push my eyes off of myself and I lift him onto Jesus and say, here I am. Maybe today it won't be the ones who are the most talented, maybe the most extraordinary people on the planet don't want to hand over their extraordinary to God. Maybe it's little people like a little boy, like a little child that says, I know it looks silly to give who I am and what I have in the face of such need, but I'm gonna look at Jesus. I'm gonna focus on Jesus, the one who can multiply I'm going to focus on Jesus, the one who could do anything through anyone. I'm going to focus on Jesus. And I'm going to hand Jesus everything I have. Yes, I am. I'm going to hand Jesus everything I have. Here it is. Jesus said to the people, sit down. Make all the people sit down. There's plenty of grass in this place. And the men sat down, about 5,000 of them, when Jesus took the loaves. And he gave thanks. And he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather up the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Let nothing be wasted. And they gathered, the, filled them up, 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over. And they gave them, they had them, and they gathered them. And I'm telling you one thing, that little boy... I'm sure he got to take full baskets home to his mom. See, some of you feel sorry for missionaries and people who give everything and lay their life down. And you think, oh, they sacrificed their lunch. They sacrificed their life. Oh, but you didn't read the rest of the story. Hey! <laughs> you didn't read the rest of the story. Twelve basketfuls left over. That little boy got to pick up the basket. He got to pick up, he got to eat as much as he wanted. You could eat cheese. He got to eat. He ate, he ate as much as he wanted. He carried that basket. He got to tell everybody, look what Jesus did. Look what Jesus did. My lunch, 5,000 people. God took my little life. Woo! A people group. I, got, I get to say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to see tens of thousands of Makua behind me going, yeah, thank you for telling us about Jesus. Come on. I'm going to see Makondi, Mwani, Shangana. I'm going to see people. I'm going to see radical laid down lovers that took tribes and believed God to reach tribes. Oh, don't feel sorry for me. Shaka Baba, I'm one of the richest people on the planet. Oh, I am. I'm rich because I found out <laughs> when I go to God, I'm poor. Shaka Baba, when I go to you, I have food. Shaka Baba, oh. <laughs> I've got holy food from heaven. Some of you, that bugs you. You're like, that's arrogant. It's actually not. It's actually the truth. Jesus said, 
If you eat Jesus and drink Jesus, then you have life. That's why I can give my life away. Because I found out this secret. And now, because I love to worship, we're going to end tonight with worship. We're going to end tonight with a hilarious, extravagant, glorious worship. We're going to worship. We are going to worship with our lives. Yeah. Don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to you know, Paul, you talked about it. To what? The works of God is to do what? To? You can read the book. It's like it's an open book test. <laughs> to believe. To believe. 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 Believe that God can take your little lunch, your little life, your little loaf, your little bread. Get rid of the disbelief. Believe God. God can use you as a scientist. God can use you as a teacher. God can use you as a chef. I think chefs are extraordinary. God can use you as a salad maker. Oh, there's a woman. I'm telling you in your church, we went, we got blessed. I know this is like off subject, but I don't care. It's important. It's a good point. It's 936B. There's a lady, sweet lady. She, she came, we had a missionary gathering at Marie's house. It was beautiful. We really loved it. And this, these three extraordinary cakes, they were the most beautiful cakes I'd ever seen. They weren't big, which was kind, you know. <laughs> they were beautiful. They were decorated. They just were super beautiful. And I thought, these cakes look more than, like there's something besides these cakes here. There's an anointing on these cakes. I thought, well, how can, I mean, I'm trying to think, don't be weird, you know. <laughs> like how can a cake be anointed? But they were anointed. And then here she comes and talk. She's, this lady is anointed to make cakes. She's anointed to make beautiful cakes. Then she prophesies over one of our missionary child children, Grace, who God saved from death just a few weeks ago, who was turning one. The parents didn't have time to get a cake because they were in super intense emergency, had to get Aravac out of Mozambique. They wanted a cake for their baby Grace's first birthday. And there's this most extraordinary cake that an anointed woman of God made and had a prophetic word for Grace. And the Lord said to me, Parasites are trying to kill grace. But grace will win. Parasites tried to take little Gracie out. But grace won. And the word was all about covenant promise. The rainbow surrounding the throne of God. Come on, let's step into grace. He also said to me, you need to just taste that cake too. Normally I don't taste cake. In Mozambique, don't tell anyone. They just gave me a big old cake for my birthday. I smear it all over the kids' faces. It's a lot of fun. I don't mind if you don't appreciate it we do we enjoy it big massive blue cake but there wasn't one single thought in my being to taste it i didn't want to taste it because i knew i knew what it tasted like but this cake 
this anointed cake, I decided because I heard, I really heard the voice of the Lord say, taste. So I, I thought, well, that's strange. People are getting wrecked. They're flopping and crying and laughing and God's on them. And I've decided I'm going into where that cake is. <laughs> it was my birthday too. One of those cakes were for me. I was excited. Normally I wouldn't even be tempted. And I'd take a piece and it didn't just look good. It tasted good. That's a prophetic word. Whatever your gift, whatever your talent, whatever your anointing, whatever it is that God has given you to do, it won't just look good. It will taste good. Because when Jesus possesses your life, everyone around will be able to smell the fragrance of Jesus on your life. It won't just be fluff and puff and smoke and mirrors. Your life will have substance and beauty and sweetness and kindness. Taste and see that the Lord is good. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him up at the last days. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, and they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I'm the living bread, Jesus said, that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I, have, I will give for the life of the world. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last days, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Hallelujah! Are you ready to feast tonight? Are you ready to end this night by feasting, feasting at a table? eating and drinking of Jesus, worshiping and dancing in the joy of the Lord. So many times we, we leave meetings, we're just laid out and we just are laid out for hours. But tonight I see a dance rising up like we saw earlier, a dance rising up where we literally give our lives with joy, where we just worship with joy. Are you ready for that? You ready to eat and drink? It's not gonna, we're not gonna do it for long or you'll be, you'll be sick. You eat and drink. You gotta, you gotta go. You gotta go. Give it away. 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 In the last few months, we've fed tens of thousands of people, dying people, starving people, hungry people. Do you know the most extraordinary thing I ever saw? I saw it in the floods. But I saw it this time too. Hey. People were pushing, didn't want the food first. They wanted the Bibles. They wanted solar Bibles in their dialect. They wanted the Word of God more than they wanted food. And they lost all their food and their homes and their crops. And they were people of another faith. And thank you to your church, by the way. Thank you, thank you, because you gave us so many of those solar Bibles. They speak their dialect, and they charge by the sun. Do you get it? Do you get it? It's the best, amazing miracle thing I've ever seen. And some Wycliffe missionary had to sit in a hut with giving their life away. And some of you would think they weren't very powerful because they didn't see a whole lot of fruit, but they gave 20 years of their life sitting in a mud hut somewhere, translating Mokwandi, Mokwani, Makua, 
Little laid down lovers who didn't see a whole lot in their lifetime. But believe me, they're reaping the fruit forever and ever 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 and ever. And it's exponential fruitfulness. What will you do with your little life? Even if you don't see it on this earth, will you give your life for the glory of God? like those amazing laid down lovers that just went out into the heat and the dust and gave their life to a people that didn't even want to hear until a cyclone hit. And they all now just say, give us the word of God. And because of those laid down lovers, we have it in their dialect. We have it in their dialect. And because of people in Australia, we could reproduce it in China. Hey! Yay, China! Yay, Australia! Yay, everybody who had anything to do with that. All right. You ready to worship him? Okay. Let's go. Let's do it.